Hi, welcome to Consider This. I'm Melissa Idris. Um, the Deputy Finance Minister, Ahmad Mazlan, recently revealed that the government is spending some 31 billion ringgit uh, to pay the pensions of more than 900,000 retirees, of which 770,000 are funded by the Retirement Fund Inc., KWAP or Co-op. Now, this 31 billion ringgit figure accounts for about 10% of the government's expenditure. The amount is projected to hit 46 billion ringgit in just seven years. Now, are we at the crossroads where reform is not just a painful choice, but rather an overdue necessity? Joining me now is economist Dr. Nungsari Ahmad Radhi. Uh, Dr. Sari, thank you so much for being on the show with me today. This pen public pension system, um, as I understand, it was first established many, many decades ago uh, for what was then Malaya and has since, of course, gone through various changes um, to the scheme over the years. What is it that we need to know, to, know, to understand about the public pension system in its current iteration today, in the context of the Malaysian economy today? Well, uh, more specifically, perhaps in the context of uh, the government's fiscal finances, right? I think uh, so when... Uh, I mean, the benefit of uh, getting a pension for public uh, servants uh, has been a legacy from the past. But the way it is funded uh, uh, is in transition right now, Melissa. So actually, it, so right now, you have Kuap, Kumpulan uh, Wang Amanah Pension, this this fund, statutory fund, uh, which is supposed to, to be big enough later on that it will fund uh, the pension liabilities of the government. Uh, but right now, it's not enough. Uh, I think there's the last uh, report that I, I read, uh, it's only like something like 185 billion uh, in the fund. The fund has been doing well, but the fund is insufficient uh, to generate income to, to pay for the pension. So because of that, the government is using its own budget which is the operating budget to pay for the pension. I think you quoted the number of 30.5 30, 30 billion, I think last year, last year or this year, uh, as, as the uh, expenditure required uh, to be set aside by in the budget uh, to pay for these pensions. Now, uh, one way to look at this problem, uh, Melissa, is actually to look, if we take 30, 30 billion, uh, 30 billion, uh, 30 billion, and you, you mentioned a figure that uh, it will grow to be 46 very soon in expenses to pay uh, to pay for the pension. So uh, if you work backwards, let's say you say, uh, let's say at a 5% return on the fund. So the fund would have to be about 600 billion. <laughs> if we have, if Coop has 600 billion today and it's earning 5%, then it will be enough to fund that 30 billion that you mentioned, right? So one way to look at this problem is to say, in a static sense, eh? not not dynamic sense, today is actually the fund is short by about 415 billion, lah, about 415 billion. So one would say that we have an unfunded liability of 415 billion, but this is static, lah, because there's a bunch of people who are working today, uh, who who will become mm. pensionable, and there's a whole bunch of people who are already uh, pensioned, and they will live on and they also become liability. Lah. So, so if you move forward uh, dynamically, uh, the unfunded liability is quite sizable. Lah, right. Actually, It's a kind of a, a, a fiscal time bomb that needs to be looked into. Okay, so so we have, uh, I think one of the figures that was quoted was about 32,000 new retirees every year. So the number of retirees growing alongside with, you know, longer lifespan of uh, life expectancy of Malaysians. Um, I, I wanted to ask you about this shortfall in um, how pension benefits are funded. Is it a matter of um, increasing the efficiency and size of uh, KW, of Coop of KWAP, or uh, should we, we also be looking at uh, ways to rethink this tax fund, taxpayer funded, non-contributory, uh, defined ben, defined benefit pension type system in today's day and age? What I, essentially what I'm asking is, would Kyrie Jamaluddin's suggestion of converting new public uh, civil servant hires into the EPF scheme 
be a feasible suggestion or solution? Well, uh, that's not an, uh, a, a new KJ novelty idea. Lah. I think the government has been thinking of doing that because, because but there must be political will to do that. You see, you see those who are already uh, under pension scheme, those who are already retired and pension, and those who are currently working and, and are already in the pension scheme, that right to the pension is protected. You can't do much about that. But by the constitution, if I'm not mistaken, yes. okay. the moment you 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 are put under pensionable scheme, the your right to that pension uh, is, is protected. So there's not much we can do. But what we can do, I'm not we lah, not you and I like the government can do. <laughs> we can do is actually they they should uh, uh, stop the the new new people coming in lah. Mm. Because you see, uh, back in 2012 or 2013 like that. The pension scheme, the public pension scheme, was made to be very generous. You know, mm. it used to be, I mean, it used to be people die earlier, lah. <laughs> so the pension stopped. But then it used to be that if the, if the civil servant dies, uh, 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 the the spouse, I don't know, it used to be that when the civil servant is male, when he dies, uh, the wife gets half. But in 2012, 2013, we changed it to the wife gets full. Mm. Mm. And then now they change also. If the civil servant is a is a female, if she passes away, the husband uh, gets pension full. So if civil servants marry younger spouses, then the government's liability go up like crazy, lah. You, you understand? So so yeah. so so we need to stop the new stuff. And the way to stop the new ones, no, we can't do much with the existing ones. Is actually we need to offer. Uh, EPF scheme lah, to these people, to the new ones. Then, then, then this liability will peak and then it will come back, come down, right? Uh, but we need to stop the new ones coming. Otherwise, it will never stop, right? It will keep on growing. So now we have to stop and we offer. Uh... All right. So you mentioned that this is not a novel idea. Um, but but why do you think, despite knowing the growing pension liability? that it remains something that is on the back burner. What are the political challenges to associated with, um, with doing this? It's financial. It's financial. You see, uh, right now, uh, in terms of the operating budget, uh, government pays salary and, and pension. Uh, let's say salary. They pay salary. They pay salary. Uh, I think quite a big chunk. Uh, a few hundred billion. Uh, now, uh, 90. Okay. So, so uh, if... The new ones uh, will uh, will be on APF, like you and I. I am no longer working like like you. So uh, your employer have to pay twelve uh, percent, then. Mm -hmm. Yeah, your employer have to pay twelve percent. So what it means is for the government, for Treasury, if we have this dual scheme in transition, while while preserving this uh, pension scheme, existing one, and putting new ones on EPF, the Expenditure for the government will go up, lah, because you know, on top of uh, the wages that they have to pay, the new uh, employees they have to pay EPF lagi uh, another twelve percent as employers. See, so that will put on more financial strain uh, on 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 public finances, and then that is the hesitation, lah, Melissa. It's I not see. so much the 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 political thing. Okay. Uh, of course, of course, you, you press, you press, you press will also make a lot of noise, lah. Uh, to be to be honest, uh, but at the same time, uh, uh, the government have to also do annual contribution to Quap, then because Quap is government as the employer should be contributing to Quap, so that Quap then manages the fund and grows the fund, and to the point where Quap can take over. Uh, the need. So actually, okay. government will end up doing two things. That's why they're not doing it. Right. So I, I, I take your point. The government will be kind of squeezed from all sides. Um, so it, it, but, but status quo is also not an option. Okay. So, so <laughs> where, where do you see? Um, so what, what options are on the table for the government? They have to go to, they have to go to, uh, to that scheme. They have to go. They have to transition. Uh, to a fully, uh, fully funded model, but this take this thing will take like two gen generations, it will take like 50, 50 years because you see people live longer lives, right? So people who who just started work will work for another thirty years, right? Then then they will probably live 
about 30 years after they retired kan? i mean maybe not 30 lah maybe mm. you know so 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 <clears throat> uh, in order to correct this i mean to to ensure that quad grows big enough uh, that it can take the liability of uh, those already in pension scheme uh, that one has to go on then uh, you need to put the new ones on epf which will then increase the opex of the government but but it has to be done otherwise this thing will explode eh? this thing will be will be a growing and growing unfunded liability and yeah. uh, so so creating budget to pay for 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 pension like you mentioned and uh, that then on top of that you got subsidy la gaji la everything so in the end the budget is what the um commitments uh, yeah. which is actually makes the budget uh totally a useless uh, fiscal tool <laughs> because there's nothing to, to to decide on it's already being decided lah. and it's like you know when i started life was like that I, I i you know i don't really decide because already commitments are already in it so the government is coming close to that on top of that they have this unfunded liability uh to, to right. of course people also mention uh, uh controlling the numbers of new uh new uh new uh, civil servants. Right. Okay. So, so you, you, so just to follow up on a couple of things that you said. Um, so, no action is not an option, but um, action would be painful in the short term, and the results will only see you know two, three generations down the road. Uh, at what point do we need to start act- acting, or this government starts acting? Uh, how do we balance? the current um you know fiscal strength of the um of the 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 government's uh, bank balance versus um planning for this unavoidable um crisis in the future we, we i mean we we have to we have to like you said the first premise is do nothing is not an option right uh, do nothing we know what it will mean it will mean that in in the not too distant future this thing will explode so do nothing is not an option. Do something is always painful. So so one of the things in life uh, <laughs> that you are taught early, everybody should be taught early, is actually if you delay something that needs to be done, it will get more painful. The pain, the it will get more painful, and you you it may it will never go away. It will just blow up in your face. So you have to do something. You have to do something. You have to do something. I think ten years ago. <laughs> but you have to do something today lah. so 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 you have to start notwithstanding the fact that it will incur uh, in the shorter term it will incur higher operating expenses to manage this this thing because at least uh you see as, as people come in and people go out there will come a time maybe about 20 years in by 20 years half the people in the civil service will be under epf yeah? so the pension liability will, will get reduced yeah? and whatever is accumulated in Co-op still belongs to the co-op and belongs to government, so it becomes like much like a fixed deposit or some annuity that you put in there that you can use later on. Right? We, we have a bit of a problem uh, uh, with our own uh, ability to control looking at cash, and right? we cannot see cash accumulating. So we need to learn how to accumulate cash and not touch it. So a lesson for the government then. Uh, Nusari, thank you for um, joining us on the show today. Economist Dr. Nusari Ahmad Ravi, uh, we're going to take a very quick break here and consider this. We'll be back with more. Stay tuned. Hi, welcome back to Consider This. I'm Melissa Idris. Let's continue our discussion about the government's growing pension liability, which currently stands at 31 billion ringgit. This is roughly 10% of the government's expenditure, and this figure is set to um, hit 46 billion ringgit in just seven years. Let's speak now to Professor Jeffrey Williams. He's an economist and provost of research and innovation at Malaysia University of Science and Technology. Uh, Jeffrey, thank you so much for joining me on the show today. Um, let's talk a little bit about the Retirement Fund Inc. or KWAP Co-op, the creation of which in 2007 was meant to help fund the government's uh, public pension bill. But it's been 15 years now, and um, KWAP Co-op's fund size has 
remained inadequate to sustainably fund the pension payouts. I'm just wondering, how do we think about this, about Co-op's role in funding the public pension bill um, and the government's growing pension liability having to foot the shortfall from Co-op? Well, I think the basic issue is exactly as you've uh, just mentioned, the fund itself, although it's grown considerably since it was first established, it's still very small. Um, I think the last number that was given to us by the uh, by Ahmed Maslan was uh, 185 billion, and they want to get it to about 200 billion. That would still be only about a fifth of the size of the EPF, for example. So it sounds like a large number, but it actually isn't very big, particularly because the total number of retirees is about 900,000 people. And that has accumulated over time as civil servants have retired. They tend to retire earlier, and also they retire on a percentage of their final salary. So what that means is that the total number of people that the fund is covering is actually quite large. Uh, the number of contributors is actually quite small. It's about 178,000 people. And although people come in and go out every year, about 32,000, the simple fact of it is the fund isn't big enough. And the return on the fund has been in the past about 6%, and quite for pushing to get that to 7%. But to cover the 31 billion pension liability, it would have to be closer to 15 or 16%. And they're nowhere close to that. And that's largely because the strategic asset allocation is based mainly in Malaysia. 80% of the funds are, are invested in Malaysia. And the returns on those funds are much lower than they could get overseas. And that means that even with a small fund, they're not able to get a big enough return. And so what that means is that they only fund about 30% about of the total pension liabilities than 900,000 pensioners. And then the government has to find the balance of 70%. And that's where the problems come in. Right. So so how how would you approach this? The um, the fact that this is, again, a looming crisis. What, what ways, um, what options are on the table for public pension from, uh, bearing in mind which, you know, uh, this pension scheme is constitutionally protected, there are legal uh, limitations. What options are on the table for the government to reform this before the, you know, before it's too late? I think one of the ways that we need to look at this is, is in terms of the fund size and then the return on the fund. If we don't look at it from that perspective, we really only have uh, two options. One is that they work longer and the other is that they save more. So the people um, involved in QAP, the civil servants involved in QAP, only uh, make a contribution worth 17.5% of their salaries. Whereas for EPF, it, it's a combination of employer and employee contribution, which is 24%. So they would have to increase that percentage. And as you mentioned, there are some legal constraints on that because any new system cannot be worse than the last system. So they would have to make the case that, well, okay, you're, you're, in, you're increasing your contribution, but in the end, it's better off. So they would then have to get the court to understand the long-term implications of that, and that might be quite difficult. So if you're not going to do it by higher contributions, you have to find an alternative way of funding it. And uh, my approach to that would be to take the fund and to make it bigger. So how can you make the total fund bigger? Well, you have to look at all of the other government-linked investment funds and accumulate them all together and turn it into a, a super fund. Now, if you had a super fund which combined all of the government um, investment uh, uh, outfits at the moment, all of which are very small now, even Kazana and PNB and uh, the development banks, they're all very small in terms of their funds. But if you amalgamate them all together, you get to nearly a trillion ringgit. Once you get a fund of a trillion ringgit, you can then start to do some really good and interesting things in terms of improving the return on the fund. And that would go some way, not if not to fund all of the public system, then at least part of it and reduce the government liability. And then the government wouldn't have to raise taxes in order to pay for civil servant pensions because they, could, they, they would be able to draw on a bigger fund in order to help to pay the civil service pensions. Okay, so so this super fund that that you're um, you're referring to has that been done in any other countries? I'm just wondering, are there experiences that we can learn from? 
Yes, most of the sovereign wealth funds around the world have two basic roles. One is development investment to help uh, infrastructure and long-term economic development. And the other is to fund the pension system. So in Japan and in Norway, for example, both of their sovereign wealth funds are there to help to fund pension system, the pension system and social protection system. And they do that by using the super funds to invest in local and international investments over the long term. And they ring fence the return. And by ring fencing it or immediately setting it aside, it's only used for pension and social protection. And it's very common. And in fact, even in Sarawak, they have now just established their new sovereign wealth fund based on the Norwegian model. And part of that, although it's much smaller, of course, but it, part of that will be used to help Sarawak to fund social protection um, projects in the future. And part of those social protection problem, uh, pro projects will be pensions. So yes, yeah. it's very common. Yeah. Jeff, do you see um, any barriers or obstacles in this? I mean, assuming that this is one of the options on the government's table at the moment to to address the rising pension liability, um, where where would you see the pushback or perhaps the the consequences of it? Yes, I think one of the pushbacks is the role of EPF, and uh, when where I have suggested this before. Um, people with EPF accounts, like myself and you and people who are watching the show, we all have EPF accounts. We know that this is our personal account. So it, it's definitely true that, you know, you wouldn't want to include EPF in this super fund because EPF already is a very well-established one trillion ringgit fund, very well managed. But this is not about merging EPF into it. It's about looking at the other underused funds and combining those. In fact, EPF could manage it. There's no problem with the idea that EPF, as a successful fund manager, could manage the second fund as well. There's no question about that. Apart from that, there is a pushback in terms of the legal framework, because as you, as you mentioned quite rightly, um, KWAP, for example, has uh, not just statutory, but also constitutional protection in some instances. And some of the other funds also have this statutory and sometimes a constitutional role. So there would have to be some unpicking um, of the legal framework you know, to put these things together. But that's more of a technical issue. In terms of the basic principles of it, it isn't being considered in my view because there are basically two approaches to funding pensions. And these approaches are you work longer and you pay more or you save more. And that's the conventional wisdom on pensions. Now, in the context of Malaysia, that won't work. It's as simple as that. It just won't work for most people because we now know that uh, for people who are in, for in their 40s or 50s and they don't have any pension saving at all, they don't have enough time to save in the, the, what's, what's left of their working life. And we also know that because incomes are very low, the median incomes below 2,600 uh, ringgit a month, it's very difficult to save meaningful amounts of money from low incomes in order to build up a fund. So that work longer, save more model doesn't really work in the Malaysian context. So we have to look for an alternative way of dealing with it. What are, what are the consequences, the consequences to um, the government's uh, funds if nothing is done, if we maintain the status quo? Okay, so if, if we maintain the status quo, what will happen is that the number of retirees amongst the civil service group will rise because they, they, they're living longer. They're, getting, they're, they're remaining healthier for longer and they're living longer. So the 900,000 uh, at the moment will approach a million. And then, of course, the pension um, liabilities for that larger number of people will begin to rise. And so the government will have to fund that. Under the current system, they have to fund it from the returns on KWAP, which are too low, then they have to fund it from general government expenditures. And what that means is that that's going to take money away from other priorities, including social protection, health, education, infrastructural development, and so on, because they're paying pensions. If they had a super fund, at least part of those pension liabilities would be paid from the bigger fund. And that would release 
the government from having to pay for the pension liabilities from its general um, income. Now, as time goes on, the government's revenue isn't going to be enough. And so people will push and push and push for higher revenue. Higher revenue means higher taxes. And that means in the current system in Malaysia, that means more consumption taxes like GST. And that means that poorer people will be paying higher taxes on the products and services that they will be buying in order to fund the pension liabilities of civil servants who have retired. And that, that's the basic problem and the basic um, um, uh, mathematical calculation. The pension liabilities have to be paid and someone has to pay it. Comes from general government revenue, that means you and me pay for civil service pensions. Jeffrey, thank you so much for being on the show. Professor Jeffrey Williams, economist and provost um, at the Malaysia University of Science and Technology, wrapping up this episode of Consider This. I'm Melissa Idris, signing off for the evening. Thank you so much for watching and good night.